Hey, everybody. Welcome to Opposing Points. Today's guest is Robert Spencer, the director of JihadWatch.org and the best-selling author of The History of Jihad, The Palestinian Delusion, Did Muhammad Exist?, and his new book, The Critical Quran. He's led seminars for the FBI and the Joint Terrorism Task Force. And in today's discussion, we talk about the facts and fictions of Islam, the threat of white nationalism, and the Afghan refugee crisis. If you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. I hope you enjoy this discussion with Robert. Hello, welcome to this episode of Opposing Points. Um, my guest today is Robert Spencer, best-selling author of The History of Jihad, The Palestinian Delusion, Did Muhammad Exist?, and The Critical Quran. Uh, how are you doing? Just great. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. So I want to start off with, um, you know, a lot of people might have uh, impressions of you if they if they Google you. Um, uh -huh. So the the notorious uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLC, um, they label you the most proliferous and vociferous, a lot of us's, anti-Muslim propagandists. Uh, you lack academic training in Islam, a bunch of quotes that are probably you know, I would assume out of context. Um, they make it seem like you're some sort of um, violent extremist. Um, to, I have never heard you call for such a thing. Um, how, do you, how do you typically respond and why do these uh, organizations come after you? Well, they come after me so that when you Google, you will think, oh, this is a bad guy, we better stay away from. Mm -hmm. and it works, it works great. Uh, just, just a couple of days ago, as a matter of fact, my publisher was trying to set up a recording studio where I could record excerpts from the critical Quran and some talks related to that, that uh, they wanted to put out with the book. And the studio, I had a very cordial chat with the studio head and we were all set. And then uh, he called the publisher back and said that he had searched for me and was canceling. Wow. And that's the idea. That's what it's all about. That's what it's for to make sure that people don't have me speak, don't read my books and so on. Now, as for the substance of it, in the first place, the violent extremist business is a plain lie. Mm -hmm. I have never called for violence, endorsed violence, applauded violence. Everything that I have ever proposed is within the realm of legal and peaceful action in the service of equality of rights for all people before the law. Now, the reason why the Southern Poverty Law Center and other groups on the left are so angry with me is because I speak about the ways in which people use the texts and teachings of Islam in order to justify violence and supremacism and hatred. So any hatred that I, is actually in my writings comes from the quotes, not from me. <laughs> and the fact is that the left loves Islam. If you criticize Christianity, you know, if you're Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris, then you're a big hero on the left mm -hmm. and everybody loves you and says you're courageous. If you criticize Islam, then you're a racist, bigoted, hate mongering, violent extremist, fascist, Islamophobe by the same people. And yet, really, if they want to be consistent, then they ought to have no trouble with the honest criticism of any set of ideas. And I tell you something, I'm routinely challenged on Twitter and uh, well, basically on Twitter, because I never go on Facebook, but uh, uh, I get emails also and they say, you're such a liar. Like, OK, tell me, point out a lie. Give me the lie that I've told and show why it's a lie. I'm still waiting. It's been years. There must be hundreds of people I have challenged in that way. Nothing. The quotes in the Southern Poverty Law Center dossiers are either factually true, but they wish they weren't, or yes, grossly misrepresented. Like for example, there's one, I think it's probably the kill shot in terms of uh, my reputation as a decent human being, is that I've said that there's no distinction in the mosques between the peaceful Muslims and the jihadis. And they say, see, you're calling all Muslims terrorists. No, that's not what I said. I said, there's no distinction. What I mean is this, when we held a free speech event in Garland, Texas in May, 2015, and we were drawing Muhammad, we were having an art contest 
actually evaluating drawings of Muhammad that had already been made. We weren't drawing mm-hmm. Muhammad at the event. And we were doing this not because we wanted to gratuitously insult anyone, but because the jihadis had just killed all these people at the Charlie Hebdo magazine in France for drawing Muhammad. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to show, look, we're against violent intimidation. We're against bullying. We are going to stand up for the freedom of speech, even at a risk. And it did come as a risk because a couple of jihadis came, drove eight hours from Phoenix to try to kill us all. Now, the uh, thing about that is that, I'm sorry, I lost it. I'm getting old, my friend. Uh, (laughs) I was leading up to something there and now I've lost it. Um, It had to do with the Southern poverty. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. The guys in the mosque, the guys who tried to kill us in Garland were mm-hmm. active in the mosque in Phoenix. One right. of them was so active that he was featured in a video that the mosque made about the things that the mosque did. And people who went to the mosques, who, who went to the mosque, who knew him said, this guy, he lives here practically. He's at the mosque day and night. He sleeps here. Anything the imam tells him, He does. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying the imam told him to come kill us all, but the fact is he wasn't put out. He was obviously a jihad terrorist, but he wasn't ever put out of that mosque. And I can give you lots of stories like that. Edward Archer was a guy who shot a cop in Philly and he was active in his mosque. And there are many others. They have not been put out of the mosque. So this is what I was saying. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that. It's just Mm -hmm. uh, actually a factually supported observation. And so that's an example of how they uh, twist things Mm -hmm. to try to discredit what I'm saying and scare people off from dealing with it on the basis of the ideas that I actually present. Yes, it's it's so interesting because I feel like that's literally happening this week as well um, with uh, them lumping people who believe in replacement theory with um, people who where you know the the left admits like we there's an article in the in the Times I think it was 2018 that like we can replace them and it's not referring nece- it's it's not necessarily they they lump in white supremacists with people who are worried that you're going to change the 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 voting I mean they admit it um and they're doing the same thing there this Very, week- as a matter of fact you know I've often noted recently that what they're doing on a broad scale now with dissenters from the leftist agenda was tried out on us, on the critics of Islam. Mm -hmm. And what they did to us is what they're doing to pretty much everybody who opposes them now. And it's funny you say this because just moments ago, right before we started this conversation, I finished an article for PJ Media, it will probably be up sometime today, about exactly that and that Liz Cheney has denounced the House leadership, the House Republican leadership, for uh, enabling white nationalism and white supremacy. Now, when you unpack that, the House Republican leadership, of course, has done no such thing. What happened was Elise Stefanik, who replaced Cheney as the head of the House Republican conference, Mm -hmm. said that uh, there's this attempt to bring in millions of illegal migrants and give them voting rights so that the Democrats will have a permanent majority. First, the left calls that racism and white nationalism, even though it isn't. And then now they're saying, because the shooter in Buffalo shot people and mentioned that, that therefore that's a terrible idea that we must never talk about. Exactly the same thing was done to us. We were calling attention to the dangers of mass migration of Muslims into Europe not because all Muslims are bad or all Muslims are terrorists, but because some of those Muslims, and here again, you can't tell which, there's no distinction, some of them are jihadis. And that's been clear from the subsequent history. It's been seven years now since the massive influx of uh, of Muslims into Europe. And there have been many of them who were responsible for jihad terror attacks. So we were calling attention to this and talking about this. And then the guy in Norway, killed 77 people in a a terrible rampage. And he publishes this manifesto, very suspicious manifesto, because for one thing, uh, I'm mentioned in it more than anybody else. And so this is another thing that's number one on my rap sheet. Oh, he inspired the terrorist. Well, 
That's a talking point, but that's not actually what happened. The terrorist actually used a documentary that I was in and he got the script. Where did he get the script? A mystery, because this is not a man who knew English well, as is clear from the manifesto itself. And yet he put in word for word perfect, the entire script of the documentary, a documentary I did in like 2002, that talks about jihad violence. Now, where did he get it? I called up the producer of the documentary. I said, where did he get the script? And he said, I don't know, because we never published it. Not only did we never publish it, we never made it. So somebody, either the shooter or somebody else, painstakingly copied this whole thing out. And you know how a script is. Every time somebody speaks, his name is mentioned. Yep. So my name um, in this guy's manifesto like 150 times because I speak in the documentary. But anyway, the thing is that this has been used ever since to claim that any criticism of jihad violence is somehow going to lead to mass death, is going to inspire shooters. In the first place, he's been the only one. In the second place, like I say, I'm suspicious that his real manifesto even mentioned this. I think it's been it's clearly been altered by somebody else. Third, he or whoever wrote the thing actually rebukes me in it, saying Spencer doesn't call for violence. <laughs> so how can they say I inspired the violence when the thing itself explicitly says I did not? And he says he was in, in, inspired to do violence by Al Qaeda's example. So he's actually not a jihadi, but he's inspired by the jihadis. But this has been used ever since, over 10 years now, to say that if you talk about the ways in which jihadis use the texts and teachings of Islam to justify violence, then you're leading to mass murder. And now it's exactly the same thing playing out over the last day with the shooter in Buffalo. That if you talk about the Democrat shenanigans with this mass migration business and what they might be up to, then mm -hmm. de facto, you are not only a racist, but you're enabling mass murder. Right. And that happens though on the left. Dayton, Ohio, 2019, a guy kills nine people. He says he's a leftist and likes Elizabeth Warren. But nobody ever said, you know, Elizabeth Warren's ideas lead to mass death because that they they control the narrative. And so they the, the some shooters mean that we can never talk about the ideas that they discuss but others do not of course of course uh, it's it's uh it's it's hypocrisy and uh what what kind of led your focus down this way originally um towards islamic terrorism was it 9 11 or did you have an eye on it beforehand of the dangers of it yeah beforehand uh i was consulting privately in the 90s mm -hmm. with some individuals and groups about these issues and my original uh, interest in it comes from actually my own family history because <laughs> my family was, uh, my grandparents were exiled from the Ottoman Empire, the last caliphate, unless you count ISIS, that uh, was abolished in 1924. And in 1916, my grandparents were kicked out because they declined the invitation to convert to Islam. They uh, came to New York and uh, the rest is history, but they, when I knew them, they were very old, and I would ask them what it was like over there when they were kids, and they would say it was beautiful, oh, it was wonderful, and it was such a great place to be, and beautiful place, and wonderful place to grow up, and my grandmother actually is the only person outside of Barack Obama. My grandmother and Barack Obama are the two people who I have heard say that the call to prayer by the Muaydeen, the guy who goes up into the tower and calls the Muslims to prayer five times a day, was the most beautiful sound they'd ever heard. <laughs> and my grandmother would hear it growing up in, in, in Turkey. And so then this, would, this kind of thing would lead to the next question, well, why did you leave? Mm -hmm. And then they, then they got vague. So I started to study it on my own, leads right into Islam because uh, it was because of Islamic imperatives that the Turks decided that the non-Muslims who had lived there from time immemorial. I mean, you know, you read Homer's Iliad and you've got Greeks in there and the Trojans that they're fighting in their Turkey, what is now Turkey, you know? And uh, anyway, they uh, wanted them out because they wanted a 
homogeneous Islamic population, a secularized Islam to be sure in nationalist Turkey, but certainly everybody would be a Muslim. And so ancient communities that had been there for thousands of years were destroyed. Yes. So, so some of these topics hit a little bit for home to, for me that you write about. Um, I was in New York City. Uh, I, I left, but um, during the there were there were large kind of riots where they were running down the streets, uh, you know, attacking cars, screaming um, like rape Jewish women and Israel as Nazis and stuff like that. Um, my sister is very small, um, whereas a Jewish star in her neck hides inside a CVS, terrified. You know, this is what this is what's going on in the streets of, of New York with um, with the kind of wrappings that they wear around their heads. Um, and they like to say uh, religion of peace. And there are many peaceful Muslims. I know them. I know some of them. And you and you've written a book, uh, you know, translating the, the Quran. So what are some of the most, in your opinion, commonly circulated um, falsehoods about it? Oh, there's so many. <laughs> you have to pick your favorites. <laughs> <laughs> the Quran, for example. Okay, I'll give you one right away. This is probably the most egregious. So we're going to start at the top here. Okay. Chapter 5, verse 32. Uh, I happen to have it right here. You will often hear this quoted. Barack Obama loves to quote it. I believe George Bush quoted it. Uh, other world leaders, presidents of the United States have quoted it. This is the uh, critical Quran my new book that has just come out and chapter five, verse 32 says, for this reason, we decreed for the children of Israel that whoever kills a human being for anything other than manslaughter or corruption on the earth, it will be as if he had killed all mankind. And whoever saves the life of one person, it will be as if he had saved the life of all mankind. Now, I tell you, I've, I've only been quoted that that's been only been quoted to me about 10,000 times. Uh, uh, Muslims saying, you're a liar, you're a terrible person because Islam is peaceful. Look, the Quran says, whoever kills one person, it's as if you've killed all of mankind. And that's how Obama quoted it too, and other people. But that's not exactly what it says. Let's look back at that again. Mm -hmm. It says in the first place, we decreed for the children of Israel that whoever kills a human being for anything other than manslaughter or corruption in the earth, it will be as if he had killed all mankind. So in the first place, this is not a generalized command. It's for the children of Israel. We decreed for the children of Israel. Nowhere does the Quran say, all of you Muslims, if you kill one person, it's like you killed all of mankind. And there's a very sharp distinction here. The, 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 the children of Israel are not the Muslims by any means in the Quran. So when it says we decreed for the children of Israel, in the first place, it's a localized command for one group of people, not for the whole crowd of humanity. Second, there's a big exception here. For anything other than manslaughter or corruption on the earth. What's corruption on the earth? Corruption on the earth is anything you want it to be. Very, very subjective. The Republic of Iran has a capital offense based on this verse, corruption in the land corruption on the earth. So they execute people for essentially dissenting from what the state wants. Mm -hmm. If the state's an Islamic state, then that means you're spreading corruption on the earth, my friend, and that's it for you. So, in, so it's not even a blanket prohibition of killing. It's not a generalized command, and it's not a blanket prohibition of killing. Mm -hmm. So the primary ways in which it is used are null and void and dishonest based on false premises because the general assumption is this is a general command for everybody with no exceptions that you're supposed to never kill. Not only that, but it goes on. Our messengers came to them of old with clear proofs, but afterwards, indeed, many of them committed excesses on earth. Who's them? The children of Israel. Mm -hmm. That's the last now, uh, pr uh, uh, proper noun referent. So our messengers, that is the prophets, came to the children of Israel with clear proofs, but many of them committed excesses on the earth, corruption on the earth. So in other words, we told the Jews not to kill, and then we sent messengers, and they still did what we didn't want. 
which means they must be killed because that's already listed as one of the things that justifies killing a human being, corruption mm -hmm. on the earth. You see? Yes. It gets worse from there. Verse 33 goes on, same thought, continuing. The only reward for those who make war upon Allah and his messenger and struggle to sow corruption on earth will be that they will be killed or crucified. Killed or crucified. Or have their hands and feet cut off on opposite sides. That sounds pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> or be expelled from the land. Such will be their degradation in this world and in the hereafter, theirs will be an awful doom. I think that last part is actually important that it's degradation in this world because that precludes any interpretation saying, oh, this is just a, a passage you should spiritualize and understand as meaning you should be harsh against unbelief or error or falsehood or sin. No, it's very clear. This is what you do with people who do these things. So mm -hmm. actually the verse that is commonly invoked by presidents of the United States and others to show that Islam is peaceful is actually saying that we warned the Jews and they're getting out of line and now they should be killed. So why do they, why do they do it? Why do they quote it? Well, they quote it because they know that most people aren't gonna read. Most people are gonna hear the quote and they only quote the little bit from verse 32. Mm -hmm. Whoever mm -hmm. kills one human being, it's as if he's killed everyone on earth. And whoever uh, saves the life of one human being, it's as if you've saved all the earth, which by the way, is lifted from the Talmud. That's, so- that, Yes, I knew that sounded like something from Judaism. Yes. <laughs> okay. And I've got the reference there in the critical Quran from where it was taken. But uh, that's, in other words, then they're counting on you not knowing that what, what else is said around this. It's interesting because I, uh, anybody, uh, myself included, but anybody who ever quotes the Quran in a way that makes it look bad is accused of taking it out of context. Mm -hmm. But in this case, if you actually look at the context, the verse gets worse. The verse gets bad. It might sound good by itself, shorn of the context. Whoever mm -hmm. kills one person is if you killed all of the, all the world. Great. Okay. But then you read the context and suddenly it's this terrible thing, warning of these terrible punishments. And so uh, in this case, the spokesman who quote this, probably when, when non-Muslim politicians quote it, like Obama or Bush or whoever, they don't know, they haven't read the Quran. And so they're just getting fed something by whoever wrote the speech. But the people, when Muslims quote it, it's very clear that they are engaged in a dishonest endeavor to mislead people about what the Quran says and are counting on not people not checking their work. Do you think they're afraid of the consequences of telling the truth? Like, you know, I, I you know Biden is very quick to uh, label you know people who support Donald Trump as you know ultra MAGA or whatever it is. Do you think it's because they're afraid of some that sort of retaliation? <clears throat> well, sure, mm -hmm. they're afraid. If the uh, I think certainly Islamic spokesmen in the West are afraid of the truth of the Quran getting out uh, because the Quran is is a book that calls for violence. It calls for hatred. It calls for all kinds of terrible things, wife beating and so on. And so there are concerted efforts to obfuscate what it says. I, uh, I can give you all kinds of big and small examples of this. The Council on American Islamic Relations will give you a free Quran for the asking. And you get it. It's this big old doorstop. It's this huge edition. I mean, this is my Quran. It's a pretty big book. It's 548 pages, but it's full of commentary. Right. If you take the Quran itself, it's really not very long. It's 77,000 words. That's the size of a good, you know, pretty fair size novel that you could read in a couple of days mm -hmm. uh, without, without taking hours and hours to read it. And so it's really not that big a book. But 
Care's Quran is like double or triple the size of this. It's a huge coffee table book. Now, why would they give that out? I think that they give that out because they know how unwieldy that would be to actually read. Mm-hmm. You can't carry it with you and open it up on the subway or 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 on an airplane or something. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just too big and heavy. And so you can't even comfortably read it at home because it's so heavy. You might dip into it here and there and open it up to where they tell you, but I think they're banking on people not reading it and discouraging people from reading it by choosing that edition to give out. Right. And another example is my own Quran that uh, came out on May 3rd and immediately went to the top of the charts. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, grateful to say it went to number one in Amazon's Quran list. And so my friend, David Wood, who uh, has 688,000 YouTube subscribers for his channel, he did a video about it. Uh, actually, it was he, he was responsible for making it number one mm-hmm. because he did a video about that it was a good addition and useful. And so it went to number one and he did another video about how it was the number one best-selling Quran in the world. And then suddenly it wasn't. Not that it had changed in the sales rankings, but it suddenly wasn't listed as a Quran. So if you're looking for a Quran at Amazon, it was suddenly gone. You, you, all, only uh, non-critical Qurans were available. So this is many, many ways in which I think there's there are so many efforts on the part of Muslim spokesmen in the West to mm-hmm. make sure people don't know about Islam. And that's one of the reasons why people like me are so vilified. Because if they just make us so toxic that nobody dares to have anything to do with us, and I commend you for actually being willing to talk to me, because many are are afraid, then they don't have to worry about refuting what I say. Mm -hmm. All they have to do is say, well, oh, Spencer, oh, he's a bad guy. What what are you reading him for? Wow, that's that's like reading David Duke. Goodness, how how could you do that? And then then the the work is done. No problem. Well, this is something that Bill Maher has taken heat for as well. I think uh, there was that famous uh, where uh, Ben Affleck was very offended on his show. Um, He's taken a lot of heat for it, too. Um, Interesting for the party he belongs to. But yeah, he's an outlier in that, in that uh, he is not unwilling to break with the party line on that issue. And that's uh, that's very unusual. And I commend him for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Although I know that he has shied away from it to some degree since then, because uh, a mutual friend was talking to him saying, yeah, you should have Spencer on. And he said, oh, I've talked enough about Islam. I really am <laughs> about it. I don't want to talk about it anymore. And I can certainly understand how he feels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I used to be uh, religious in Judaism. So I've, I've read the Old Testament and stuff like that. So I'm sure this is a common question you probably get. Um, you, you were talking about how the... Uh, Quran talks about um, wife beating or, or sex slavery, child marriage with uh, Muhammad and uh, what, was the, what was the girl's name? Isha. Aisha. Aisha. Um, and so, you know, I've read the Old Testament. There's uh, similar stories of like God swallowing people, them slaughtering villages. Uh, one of my uh, all time uh, favorite weird ones is, is the two daughters seducing their father uh, to get pregnant. Um, do you think that there's any uh, amount of equivalency or, va- or value to the point that, hey, the religions are just kind of screwed up and we should just have them in their modern form of being spiritual and, and uh, I guess you would call them reformed? Uh, do you think, what do you think of that? Well, in the first place, it's a, the whole argument is a trick mm-hmm. uh, because you have interpretative traditions in the two religions that consider those passages that you just alluded to scripture, Judaism and Christianity, neither one of them considers those, those, those things to be valid for today. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly they create a number of theological problems in themselves as to why would God have ever said to do such things or why would this have ever happened in the first place? But nobody's going around clearing out cities and saying we're imitating Joshua uh and 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 therefore it's okay nobody is using these passages as 
uh, the justifications for terrorism in the modern world. Now, in Islam, unfortunately, and the Quran, that's not the case. There are organizations all over the world that use the Quran, that point to the Quran. Uh, I write about the Palestinians all the time and how they're always quoting the Quran and talking about Islam. And yet the Quran and Islam have never had the slightest role in any analysis from the State Department, or as far as I know, from the Israeli government in any of these peace processes. And yet it's all about what they talk about. They don't talk about it in any other terms, as a matter of fact. And yet nobody seems to care. But uh, as far as the Hebrew Bible goes, it seems to me that as long as you don't have terror groups invoking it, then this is why that argument is a trick, because you don't have, on the other hand, Islamic groups saying, oh, these passages about violence, they don't apply today. You have a lot of actually Islamic spokesmen in the West who say that, mm -hmm. but try to find an actual Islamic group, a sect of Islam, a school of Islamic jurisprudence, something major like that, that actually teaches that those passages have no validity for, for, for the present day, or nor will, they, nor will they be valid again in the future, you're not going to find it. And you've got plenty of people saying these things are very much valid for today. Right. Because I, I, think, I think that would be a similar uh, response because, to how people say, well, the Crusades or, well, the violence in the Bible, um, those are things that happened, or uh, Christians burning witches at the stake. Um, that would be the argument that, that they would say, hey, religion in general has killed a lot of people. Sure. Well, Christians burning witches at the stake was two or 300 years ago. The yeah. Crusades were 700 years ago. They ended 700 years ago. They were successful about 900 years ago. And why is there no more of that? Obviously, these things ended for some reason. Why, on the other hand, has Islamic Jihad continued? And I wrote a book in 2018, The History of Jihad, that shows that there's always been jihad. There was never a time when any significant Muslim group said, hey, we're going to give all this up. This is over. Jihad is done. Or uh, war and conquest are done, and we're going to wage jihad in some other way by uh, studying to better ourselves and to become more spiritual or something. There is no such. There's always been jihad violence throughout Islamic history for 1400 years. So why the difference? Why are we talking about the Crusades and the last Crusader state was destroyed in 1291 and there hasn't been anything like that since then? Why aren't Christians calling Crusades now? What's changed? And then when you look into the Crusades vis-a-vis -vis Islamic Jihad, you see that Islamic Jihad has roots in core Islamic teachings that are based on the Quran and the example of Muhammad, whereas the Crusades do not have any such basis in the New Testament or the teachings of the various Christian churches. There is no Christian church that has a doctrine calling for violence against non-Christians in order to bring them under the hegemony of Christianity. Yeah, but every Islamic group has that. So the, the, the other thing I hear is that uh, jihad doesn't mean war. It means struggle. It's just right. struggle. Is that, yeah, is that true? It doesn't mean war. It means struggle. Quite so. Okay. God means struggle. And there are all kinds of struggles, you know, just as there are all kinds of struggles in English, there are all kinds of jihads, I should say. In Islamic Republic of Iran, there's a Department of Agricultural Jihad. It doesn't mean let's blow up the farm. It means we're going to try to increase the efficiency of the farm. Okay. And that's the struggle agriculturally. But in Islamic theology, and this is what they don't tell you, yep. the primary meaning of jihad is warfare against unbelievers in order to extend over them the hegemony of Islamic law. Okay. That is all the major sects of Islam, Sunni, Shiite, all the subgroups like the Wahhabis and all that, they all teach this. There are a couple of outliers like the Ahmadis 
who are considered heretics and viciously persecuted in Pakistan and Indonesia, who are about 1.8% of Muslims worldwide, and they reject jihad violence, although they do not reject the universal imperative to impose Sharia. Uh, but if you're looking for mainstream Islamic groups that reject jihad violence, there aren't any. So we need a Biden jihad against the baby formula shortage, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. That's exactly it. Yes. And that would be a perfectly reasonable word to use in that context in Arabic. No problem at all. Nonetheless, the, as I say, the primary jihad in Islamic theology involves warfare against unbelievers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the other thing I, I, I want to move on to is um, I, ha I have a, a group of friends. We always talk about uh, about stuff like this. One of them is one of them is liberal. The other one's more conservative like me. Um, and one of them also has the similar concerns about about Islam in general with the with the Bill Maher view. Um, and so we were talking about the as the, the refugee crisis was happening from Afghanistan. I was sort of arguing that, you know, we don't know who these people are. You know, we don't. We're not how are we properly vetting these people um uh so <laughs> the argument was well maybe there's a few um but are we going to expose the rest to a human rights violations uh from from the remaining regime um and uh how do you how do you balance uh, rescuing or saving innocent people and and, and that you know they, a lot of a lot of people likened it to the holocaust and and how we rescued Jews from, from their fates in Germany? Well, they're here now. I'm certainly not, I would certainly not advocate sending them back there. Just the fact of their having been here is liable to get them killed were they to go back. Mm -hmm. However, that doesn't mean I'm in favor of having brought them here because the whole thing was catastrophically mishandled. You can say we cannot leave these people to their fate because they helped the American military and Thus, we deserved, they, we, we owed them a favor. But the people who got out were not the people who helped. And the administration has acknowledged this. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of the people brought over were not the people who were applicants for or bearers of the special immigrant visas that were given to the people who actually helped us in Afghanistan. So who are they? We don't know who they are. And that could be very dangerous. In the second place, they were not vetted. The administration has also admitted, Congressman Darrell Issa from California went over to Qatar, to the base where they uh, were held before coming here. And he talked to, they wouldn't even let him on to the base, but he had an extended interview with the people who were running the base and they admitted that as many as 82,000 of the Afghans who were in the United States now were not vetted at all. Also, what's, what was the vetting? We had lists of criminals and terrorists. There was a brisk business in fake IDs toward the end of our presence in Afghanistan. Could a criminal or terrorist have gotten a fake ID and come over here and not be on the list? Why not? What would, I suspect it would probably be a fairly simple operation. Also, when you have that crush at the Kabul airport, mm -hmm. you have probably the, the strongest, best armed and most ruthless people going to the front of the line. Who are they? The criminals and terrorists. So is the solution to, how, like, what is broken about our vetting system exactly? How do we fix that to make it, is there a way to fix it? How, how do we improve it so that we can, if we need to provide such aid? Um, and at the same time, um, protect uh, the people that already live here. Yeah, this is very important. One, it, and it could be done. One of the things that the Obama administration decided 10 years ago was that Islam had nothing to do with terrorism. And so our entire counterterrorism program would be stripped of any mention of Islam or jihad, which means that people who do the vetting, as well as intelligence agents, law enforcement officials, unless they learn it by themselves, they don't know anything about jihad violence, jihad terror, the causes of it, the impetuses for it, the goals of it, they don't know anything about it. So if you had people who knew something about it, 
Mm -hmm. I could in interview the people coming into the country intelligently and ask them about their views of various things. Israel's a real good one to ask about, to see what kinds of views that they have about various things in order to try to assess the possibility of there being jihad terrorists or becoming jihad terrorists in the country. Also, there are a number of cultural issues with the Afghans. The practice of the bachabazi, the victimization, sexualization of the young boys is very common in Afghanistan and often taken for granted as being completely acceptable. That was a American big problem in Europe, I think, uh, where they were, they were assaulting young boys, right? Yeah, very much so. Mm -hmm. And American forces were told a few years ago while we were in Afghanistan, not to bother our Afghan allies about this. It was considered to be important to maintain the alliance and it was and that it, making trouble about Bachabazi was supposedly gonna threaten the alliance. So now we have people over here who may take it for granted that they can do that. And there have already been several Afghan migrants who mm -hmm. have been arrested for sexual assault and related issues. And one of them quite ingenuously said, this is perfect. What I did was perfectly acceptable in my culture. Yes. If we had intelligent vetting. We could also get at the heart of that, those kinds of attitudes as well. And make sure that nobody gets into the United States without first being thoroughly educated into American mores regarding children and what's appropriate behavior and what isn't, and so on. But uh, none of this is done because of course, that would mean acknowledging that there's some problem to start with, and that would put a bad light on Islam because Afghan culture is so thoroughly Islamic. And so nobody wants to go there. That'll never happen because above all, we must not make Islam look bad. Yes, there were a few of those cases. One, I think, beat his wife or, or a female guard. Um, I think one sexually assaulted a child. Um, I think there were a, three or four of these instances. Um, compared to the, to the number of people that we brought over, some might say like that's not indicative of a larger problem and we shouldn't damn them all for, for the actions of a few. Okay. Like I said, they're here. I'm yeah. not advocating they'd be sent back. Right, 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 right. I think we're going to hear from a lot more of them. However, unfortunately, it's not going to be just a small number by the time this is all finished. Right. And um, I guess I, I know Ben Shapiro did a video about this years ago, but just by the number, sheer number of people that belong to the faith, even if I think like a few, like one percent were radicalized and violent that is still probably about a million or so or at least right i don't know if you've you've done yeah. similar calculations yeah absolutely it's a it's a huge number actually uh that if you take a billion muslims and say that 10 percent hold to these views and you're still talking about 100 million people and uh that's obviously a huge number of people and even if you reduce that down even if you are just talking about a million people who hold to this. That's still, imagine a million committed jihad terrorists. It only took 19 to kill 3,000 people in New York and Washington mm -hmm. on 2001. Right. Um, the, the other topic I was eager to talk to you about is, uh, is it going back to uh, white nationalism. One of the things that you say is that um, Islam is the biggest threat facing us today. Uh, I know the FBI director is on record saying that uh, white na white supremacy was. I know a lot of people are saying that white supremacy was. Um, I know there was the uh, the attack uh, yesterday um, in Buffalo, or I, I think it was yesterday or two days ago in Buffalo. Um, and uh, I know I read an article from the Washington Post that also proclaimed that most domestic terror is by right wing terrorists. So why do you and the FBI director disagree? because I tell the truth and he doesn't. <laughs> Antifa is just an idea too. <laughs> the uh, fact is this white supremacist business is designed ultimately to stigmatize and criminalize their political opposition. And the la lack of white supremacist terror attacks is an indication of that. Uh, I'm not saying this Buffalo thing is a fake or a false flag. It's, it is, however, extraordinarily convenient 
for the political and media elites because I myself, I'm not saying they pay any attention to me, they've already done their number on me, but over the last couple of weeks, I have repeatedly said in interviews that they say white supremacy is the biggest terror threat. Where are the white supremacist terrorists? And then lo and behold, here comes one with a manifesto already. And uh, well, they're gonna make as much use of it as they possibly can. But the fact is that even if what they say is true about the United States, it's based on playing with the numbers. Because what I've seen in several studies mm -hmm. is that the white supremacists have killed more people than other groups. Right. What about failed plots? They never enter in. I track jihad activity every day at jihadwatch.org and have for years. And I can tell you, there are an awful lot of failed plots in the United States. And we can thank our law enforcement that they're not still so thoroughly politicized that they, they were not unable to catch these guys. And I'm grateful for that. But I would imagine that if you factored in that, that it would not look as if the white supremacists were the biggest threat so much. Also, another very important point, and that is there are jihad groups on every continent, but there are not white supremacist groups in Asia and Africa. This is an American phenomenon, mm -hmm. and I think a minuscule one, and maybe you'll find some, uh, a couple of groups here and there in Europe. Yes. Well, the, the way, the numbers on you, you were saying like what's counted. I, I think about the, uh, the sicko that shot up the, the, the massage parlor. He said, this isn't why I did it. I have a problem. And I wrote about this because um, I, I wrote a, a blog post about that Washington Post article. And uh, he said, you know, I didn't do this. I just, you know, rather than focus on the, the porn addictions that are all over the, the country, they immediately said he doesn't get to decide what his motive was. And that's counted and lumped in there as well. Yeah. And they're obvious lunatics, obvious people with terrible psychological problems who uh, are counted in as white supremacists. Now, look, it's also, I have repeatedly criticized European and American officials for talking about uh, mental illness when you have a guy screaming Allahu Akbar and stabbing random people on the street and waving a Quran around. And they say, oh, this has nothing to do with Islam. It's mental illness. Mm -hmm. uh, but even if you grant that there are some mentally ill people in the context of Islam who turn to this violence, and grant on the other side that there are some mentally ill people who turn to violence in a white supremacist context, I would expect that you will find many, many more who do this in an Islamic context. And I would uh, suggest that that's because Islam sanctifies violence and blesses violence. And there isn't any kind of support like that in a, in a white supremacist context. I mean, it's a violent thing insofar as it is. And I suppose if you're a national socialist or something, then you might think that violence is a good way to go. But this is uh, here again, just not a big phenomenon in American life. I mean, have you ever met a white supremacist? I never have. I'm no. six years old. I've lived all around this country. I've never met anybody who said white people should be in some special status beyond that of everybody else, never once. But I've met I've met plenty of Muslims who have said uh, things that made the my skin crawl and made me think I better make a hasty exit out of here. Uh, and plenty of people who speak openly about this kind of Islamic violence. I don't know. I mean, that's anecdotal, of course. I'm just one guy. Right. We've but, never we never heard again of the guy who rammed his car into Capitol Police. And we've never we, we're not hearing about the the car that, you know, found its way. I didn't know self-driving was so advanced that it could, you know, aim at people through a parade. Never hear yeah. about it anymore. Yeah. And the fellow in uh, Frank James, the fellow in the Brooklyn subway. He's who, friends with R. Kelly now. Don't, <laughs> it's just uh, it's it's these things disappear and you don't hear people talking about how all the left's race baiting 
and exacerbation of racial divisions in the United States are leading to violence because that's not the line the political elites want you to take. Yeah, and, and that whole thing also kind of goes against the narrative that they're killing, you know, they're, you know, if you're black and you commit a mass murder, that they're they're going to kill you, and if you're white, they'll let you they'll let you uh, live, because Frank James turned himself in. Fine, he's alive. And so is the fellow in Waukesha, right? Yeah, Darryl. yeah. When I when I Daryl Brooks, when I saw that that's that person fed him uh, fed him beforehand, I was just oh my god that he let him into his house. <laughs> what what a what a tragic, tragic, tragic event. Um, so uh, where, where can people uh, follow you and, uh, and where can they buy the book? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the Critical Quran is the number one best-selling Quran that's not a Quran at Amazon. And uh, it is uh, at Barnes and Noble and anywhere books are sold, you can order it. It, I'm also at jihadwatch.org, which is the only news site that tracks jihad activity in the United States and around the world every day, day in and day out, and also at Jihad Watch RS on Twitter. Yes, uh, when I uh, when I was growing up, I used my father used to always purchase the politically incorrect guides. So oh, yeah. it was uh, <laughs> it's kind of a, an honor to, to to have the chance to speak to you. Uh, although I don't know. I know you were saying, oh, most people wouldn't speak to you, but uh, <laughs> so uh, it's it's uh, it's an absolute uh, pleasure speaking to you. I think people can get a lot out of out of this, and uh, and good luck with with the book. And uh, I, I hope to buy a signed copy, hopefully. Oh yeah, I'd be happy to do that. If you email me at director at jihadwatch.org, we can set that up. Okay, awesome. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.